Hello, everybody, to this uh, Lean Up Succession. My name is Dimitris Tiladis. I'm the CTO and co-founder uh, here at the Labs. And I have with me George Apostolopoulos. Uh, George is uh, one of the founding engineers in our team. Uh, he has uh, a long experience with uh, machine learning or the intersection of machine learning, AI, and security. And he's here to talk with us about uh, the basics of large language models and what does this mean for security professionals? What are the potential risks that one has to uh, consider as uh, the adoption of uh, LLM technologies in cruises three, increases through an enterprise? And uh, we are excited to hear from you, George. So why don't you take it and uh, let's, uh, let's have a discussion about it. Yep, thank you, Dimitri, for the introduction and uh, hi, everyone. Um, so let's see. Uh, definitely, as you all know, uh, you everybody must have heard about LLMs, generative AI. Uh, it's everywhere these days. It's really hard to miss, right? So I have some numbers here, and then we'll see what this all means. So there are about uh, almost 500,000 models in the hugging phase, uh, almost 100,000 more. Uh, data sets in Hugging Face. Uh, and uh, as recently as a few months ago, there was more than 1 million model downloads from uh, Hugging Face. So yeah, let's, let's see what are these models, uh, what Hugging Face is and uh, how uh, security professionals uh, can learn about uh, how to use these models and also what are the risks that come from these models, right? Uh, so let me maybe get rid of this. Uh, so. Very briefly, what is a large language model? Uh, that's a fairly complex topic, so we'll keep it at a very high level. So this is pretty much a specific type of machine learning model uh, that has been trained on a large amounts of text, and it's very good at predicting the next word. word. You give it a sentence, and it is pretty good at predicting what is the next word that will come after the text you gave it. Uh, this sounds pretty basic, but uh, it has been proven to be extremely effective. So it works really well for specific uh, use cases that have to do with text and also very interesting for us with code as well. So there is a huge amount of activity into uh, models that actually can predict how to write code, how to complete code. Everybody knows about GitHub Copilot, right? So all these things happening. Um, when we hear about a model, there are are some basic things that we need to know to kind of get our bearings around what the model is and how it looks and what are the properties that we care. Uh, so models have a, a number of weights that for some technical reasons, they come into these increments of 1, 7, 13 billion, 35 billion, 70 billion. So we talk about a huge number of numbers, right? And these weights are just numbers. Uh, and uh, at a high level, the more numbers, the higher the number of parameters, the better the model is, right? Although the quality of how do you measure the quality of the model is a pretty complex topic. Um, then the model has a side uh, size. Uh, of course, the size depends on the number of parameters, so more parameters result into a larger model, but as well also uh, the quantization of the weights is important because these uh, weights can be 16 bits, 32 bits, 4 bits, right? Uh, these weights come in some format, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, what that means, but this has to do with how easy it is to load it and run it. And also, again, as we're going to cover, uh, these models typically are built on top of uh, other models, uh, and uh, they are trained on specific data sets. So talking about other models, right? So uh, a very important thing to understand in this whole LLM space is that uh, you need... a a good building block. So there is this concept of foundational LLMs. So these are pretty much big LLMs that somebody has trained and somebody has trained uh, on a lot of data. Uh, so we're talking about billions of training words or tokens. Um, and this training typically takes a huge amount of time and uh, GPU time. Uh, all this, of course, are trained on GPUs. Uh, uh, CPUs are not very good for this kind of processing. And they take some people that are pretty good at certain types of distributed systems to get these things to run and train successfully. Uh, and the important message here is that this is actually a very expensive thing to do, right? I mean, it is takes even paying for these GPUs is tremendously expensive. Uh, buying these GPUs, especially these days that are very rare, is expensive, right? So 
Uh, the message here is that is not this is not for everyone, right? I mean, there are a few organizations that have the resources to do that. Um, and here I have some numbers that show you the GPU hours of you know training the 70 billion Lama 2 model, which is one of the things that uh, uh, Meta has open sourced. Um, so not many people can do that, right? I mean, not many organizations can do that. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that ah, before we go to the interesting thing, let's look a little bit at uh, actually who is building this, right? So. Uh, and there is a huge divide here uh, between uh, commercial LLMs and open source LLM. Everybody knows about OpenAI, Google has Bard and a lot of other LLMs. Uh, Microsoft has the partnership with OpenAI, Anthropic with Claude. Um, so these are companies that actually undertake the effort and they pay the price of training these very big LLMs. And of course, they do, they do use them to make money. Uh, so customers can use these LLMs through APIs or they can do a private cloud deployment. Uh, and uh, of course, the weights of these models are not public. So people use them, but they have no idea what is in these models. Uh, on the other hand, we have open source LLMs, but this actually is interesting because since this it's extremely expensive to train these models, there has to be somebody that is brave enough or doesn't care too much about the business applications to actually open source this, right? So we have Facebook, for example, that has open source uh, Llama 2. We have a few other organizations. Some of them are funded by governments uh, that actually they say, fine, we're going to pay the price. We're going to train these big open source LLMs and uh, these big foundational LLMs, and then we're going to open source them, right? So people can use them. And open sourcing here means that uh, all the weights are freely available, so everybody can copy the model and can run it, right? Um, and right now, so yeah, so George, practically, uh, the big foundational LLMs mm -hmm. uh, are very few, right? And there are either the commercial ones that nobody can potentially get access to, uh, but as enterprises are trying to build their own functionality on top of the LLMs, they have to rely most likely on open source LLMs if they try to build something internally, right? So they use the foundational LMS as the building block Correct. built on top on top of this, right? Great. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and uh, here at the bottom, you can see that are really very few because we said that the larger models are the ones that are actually have good performance. So if you look at which of them are open, what are the options for a op uh, open source foundational models? I mean, there are not that many. It's uh, Lama 2 from Meta, of course. Uh, Falcon, MPT, Stable LM, and Bloom. Uh, and Llama is definitely the most popular right now. And there is also the, it's not so simple as saying open source, right? Because definitely for these models, the weights are available. So everybody can download them and run them, but doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, they can use them for commercial applications. There are license restrictions that come with them. And sometimes also the data sets that people use to train or fine tune these models have license restrictions. So if you really look at it, really open source LLMs, foundational LLMs that people can use and they don't have license restrictions are actually even less, right? Llama 2 and Stable LM, they do have some kind of license restrictions. They cannot use them for commercial purposes. So there is a very small choice of open source foundational LLMs. Um, right. So, and then uh, for an enterprise, the risk here. There are two risks, right? They can use an LLM, potentially somebody use an LLM that is not really open source, although it is available, right? right? It has licensing restrictions. Or this LLM can be built uh, from a data set that is potentially proprietary and potentially there are intellectual property issues that come and uh, can affect an enterprise, right? So an enterprise that builds something on top of foundational LLMs needs to have some visibility on where these things are coming from. Certainly, right? Yeah, and that's one of the things we'll cover later, right? But uh, yes, uh, uh, every somebody that wants to use one of these has to be really very careful at reviewing all the information available and possibly talking to legal, right? Because there is definitely a lot of constraints. Uh, the good thing, though, is that after one finds one suitable and uh, uh, possible to use and without many license restrictions or foundational LLMs, then you can do a lot of interesting things on top of it, right? So, uh, and the main thing is what people call fine tuning, which is essentially I, I take this foundational open source LLM, which is a good general purpose model, can do a lot of things. And then I, I try to kind of 
uh, give it some extra knowledge so it can handle one of my use cases uh, better. And this is typically means that I have to continue training a little bit more, giving it some new data set that is specific to my use case, right? So this is called fine tuning uh, and can take a few forms. Uh, I can do instruction tuning. So that means that I, I try to teach the model to follow uh, instructions better. So I can uh, ask, I have some kind of chat model, for example. Uh, alignment tuning is typically what people do to teach the model to not generate toxic outputs or uh, the outputs of the model will align with, with, align with what humans would do. Uh, some people go the other way and they try to uncensor models uh, because they want to use them for whatever reasons. Uh, people can merge models, so you can combine models to come up with a combined better model. Uh, and also you can quantize the weights, so that means you can actually reduce the size of the model. Uh, so uh, definitely there are very few organizations that, that create the foundational LLMs, but then uh, there is all these things that one can do on top of these foundational LLMs. Uh, and these are actually quite easy to do, turns out, because first of all, there is a lot of open source tools that people can use to do all this. Uh, so for example, we have things like PEFT, which is for efficient fine tuning. We have uh, Axolotl, again, for fine tuning. We can merge, have merge models through Merge Kit. Um, there are a lot of open source libraries where one can actually use to, to run, to deploy and run this model, right? Because the model is a bunch of weights. At some point you have to deploy it and send it questions, right? So you can use it. Uh, and uh, not only you have a lot of open source code, but also this uh, fine tuning steps, this uh, remixing steps, if you want, they're not that hard, right? I mean, it may take weeks and weeks of uh, GPU time to train the foundational model. But when it comes to fine tuning the model, on a, especially on a smaller data set, this could be actually a couple of days on a home grade GPU, right? right. It's not very expensive. And the same uh, thing. In order to, to, to explain to everybody, right, the, the, the goal of the fine tuning and the remixing and everything is that you want to customize the LLM to your specific application domain, right, or specific applications. And that is what the majority of organizations are actually doing, right? the, other than the big four or five, right? the majority of organizations just fine tuning on top of the existing uh, LLMs that are there. Correct. And that's an example, actually. Uh, this is something that was taken from uh, uh, Hugging Face, which we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and uh, I know the picture is kind of small, hard to read, but pretty much here on the right, there is one of these foundational LLM models. This is some model that was actually came from organi an organization in China. And you see that on top of this, people build something else and some other people build something else. And then somebody else actually combined these two to generate this model. And then somebody else came and I said, okay, I'm going to quantize this model ways to make it smaller. So you have this chain, this lineage, if you want, of models. So this model on the left actually came through a few other models, through remixing and uh, multiple people in getting involved, right? And I think that's right. a very typical picture that you see uh, today in the open source LLMs. So the open source LLMs now are becoming a little bit like the open source code. I mean, it's data and not code, but it's becoming like the open source code, right? So. We essentially have here a whole dependency tree where the, the leftmost LLM, if you use the leftmost LLM, you have pretty much uh, used, if you want, the result of a combination of several one of these models here. And not just several of these models, but several of the data behind these models. And now the risk as an enterprise is if one of them is problematic either for licensing reasons or for data quality reasons or for whatever reasons, then the whole thing can be potentially infected, right? And it seems to me that the industry is not mature enough to figure out yet the, the licensing or dependency mechanisms to discover all these things at this point, right? At least in for open source code, we know that if you have a GPL license somewhere, it contaminates the whole thing. But in this case, we are kind of blind on what is happening. Is that right? Yes, I, I agree, right? I mean, right now there is definitely a lot of excitement. Uh, as, as I mentioned at the beginning in the hacking phase, you have thousands of models. People use it all the time, but I think it's mostly developers that, uh, or at least, or also enterprises, but that uh, everybody is experimenting, right? Uh, so people have these powerful tools that are experimenting, that are remixing things. Uh, but when it comes to commercial uses, yeah, I don't know if, 
people have fully realized the complexity here, right? Because as you mentioned, there is a lot of stuff hidden under the model, a lot of license restrictions, a lot of other things, uh, which are actually pretty hard to even figure out, right? So even to figure out this picture that I showed here, this required a lot of digging actually in hugging phase, right? Um, yeah. So it's not so easy. So we're, we're, it feels that we are kind of in the same stage as the early stage of open source adoption to the, right, where everything was the wild, wild west. And uh, pretty much the lessons that we learn from open source adoption, we have to somehow translate to this because it's a, another form of software supply chain at this point, right? It's just that it's a model supply chain. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's uh, right. And we'll come to this as models of dependencies in a little bit, right? But uh, before uh, the hugging phase is come, keeps coming, I talked about it already 20 times. So what is hugging phase? And hugging phase, uh, most people will be familiar with it, but it's pretty much the same way that you have uh, POI, PI, or NPM to keep track of uh, software and packages. Pretty much hugging face is the, the main place where people actually uh, exchange models, right? So you have a model developers and builders or mixers that are actually building stuff and upload it there so other users can uh, can use it, download it and use it. Also, there are definitely enterprises using this to share their models, right? Uh, so this is where everything is happening, right? And uh, pretty much hugging face is the main uh, place where this is happening. I think there are a few other uh, sites where people can exchange models, but nothing is as popular as Hugging Face, right? So this is the front page of Hugging Face. And you see they have almost 500,000 models, right? I mean, the, the number I had at the beginning. Uh, and Hugging Face is a fairly complete offering, right? I mean, uh, we don't need to go into all the details, but pretty much they host both models and data sets. Uh, they do have users, organizations. Uh, they provide authentication. Actually, they also allow you to run some of these uh, LLMs, right? Uh, so they allow you to host them. Uh, so you don't really have to download it and run it on your system at home, right? I mean, you can host it there. And I think that's going to be one of the main things in the business model going forward. Uh, and also they have API access, a leaderboard to track model performance and many other things that you would expect, right? Um, and if you look at a particular model, how it looks in hugging face, uh, this is what you'll see, right? So this is the name of the model. Uh, and pretty much it's a Git repo, right? I mean, if you look a little bit under the hood, what is happening, this is a Git repo, and these are the files uh, here. And uh, there is a bunch of huge binary files, which is actually the model weights, because that's, that's what the model is. And then you see this is a pickle format, which we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, and there is uh, some configuration files that uh, allow somebody who wants to use the model to deploy it easily. And there is a huge readme file that uh, usually contains everything else that people who want to share about the model. But this is kind of a free form thing, doesn't have any particular requirements, right? But this is mainly the place where people put additional information about the model, how it was built and all this stuff. So this is how it looks. Uh, in Hugging Face, and also important is to notice that uh, Hugging Face definitely do have some security features will become relevant as we go to the potential risk, right? So in addition to the standard stuff that you we would expect from a service, uh, Git access over SSH and all these things, they do things like malware scanning. So that means that uh, if you upload the model, they do some kind of malware scanning in the binaries. Uh, they do pickle scanning because pickle is one of these packets formats that can be uh, problematic. And also the scan for secrets. Uh, so if you upload the model in hugging face and one of these files contain a secret, uh, they will they will tell you, right? Uh, so now going back to the discussion earlier, right? I mean, yes, I think it, it's fair to say that uh, these LLMs are Git dependencies, right? Because uh, there is some additional external functionality that I'm, I bring into my application. It's not something I built, I import it. And, uh, fair bit of my application's functionality, now it will depend on this, right? Uh, and um, in some sense, uh, we all hate to deal with source code dependencies, but comparing to LLM, source code dependencies are easy in the sense that uh, uh, if I want to have a dependency, the source code is there, right? So I can always go review the code, I can build it, I can test it. If I have the time, I can be fairly confident to find out what is inside, right? Uh, LLMs is actually 
much harder because uh, pretty much uh, models is a bunch of data, right? It's just the model weights. Uh, there is some additional information in the readme, but this is actually not really verified or anything, right? So there is no way to confirm that this information is uh, accurate or not. So essentially, I, I bring into my application a massive amount of binary data. Uh, and as we discussed, this binary data can come through some other LLMs with a lot of remixing steps uh, that can incorporate data sets that I don't know much about, right? Um, so essentially, not only I bring a massive amount of data in, but uh, there is extremely little visibility about what is in that data and what does this data do. Even uh, ensuring that the model works correctly is very hard, right? Because these models uh, can do complicated things, right? So I have to have a complete test harness that is very complex, right? And very, um, very elaborate to make sure that the model actually works correctly, right? It's not like a source code dependency where I run the test and I'm, I'm fine, right? So definitely these are dependencies and uh, like any other dependency, right? I mean, they will bring both operational risk and security risk. People try to split this into two, these two buckets. And um, definitely there are operational risks, right? Because licensing is, as we talked already, one important one, right? Because uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of complexity to figure out if the model, the models it was based on, the data sets used are actually clean in terms of licensing. Um, there is a huge amount of churn right now in terms of new models becoming popular and people abandoning old models, right? So if I say I want to use something from Hugging Face, uh, I have to make sure it's not abandoned, right? Uh, also, a lot of models are kind of not really very used. Uh, some of them are extremely popular and everybody's using them. So if you have questions, you can find out easily and you can get some kind of support from the community. Uh, if these are some weird models that nobody's using, again, you don't really want to deal with them. Uh, as I already mentioned, it's very hard to make sure that this performance of the model is good or not, right? Um, and some of the models could be actually pretty dangerous in the sense that they may actually generate toxic content, right? Uh, there is this alignment training, right? So some models have been uh, aligned trained, if you want, so they're safer, so they would not generate much toxic content. If other models have not been aligned trained, then they can generate toxic content, which obviously is not a good idea for an enterprise use, right? And I think the important thing that uh, we should never forget is that uh, Essentially, the model is few gigabytes of binary data, and there is really no way to figure out what is actually going into that model, right? Uh, and of course, security, right? I mean, uh, you would think that because the models are binary data, this is actually pretty safe, so there is nothing wrong that actually can happen by downloading binary data, but actually that's not necessarily the case. Uh, there is this Pickle format thing that um, Pickle is a very popular Python library to serialize and deserialize Python structures. And because almost 99% of the uh, machine learning ecosystem is in Python, this was the standard format to exchange data. Uh, and uh, it turns out that this format has a vulnerability. So actually somebody that is malicious can inject some code that actually can execute uh, while you try to load the data into memory, uh, resulting in the remote code execution, right? So binary data is not safe in this case. Uh, and uh, then you have the additional risk of, uh, like every time you go to NPM or in other places, of course, there are malicious uh, actors there that actually they try to uh, hijack popular models. So for example, they try to hijack one popular model and uh, uh, replace it with a model that is malicious, right? So or the weights are kind of, uh, compromise so then you can download the model and, and can get infected uh, or even attackers can still steal the like credentials of uh, popular hacking phase developers and again they try to replace the data right so all these sort of attacks that we have kind of learned to anticipate in npm and all the other public source code repositories also apply to hacking phase as well uh, and then, and then, uh, obviously since we are like it looks like since we're at the very early stages of all this development right none of there is no provenance here. There is not even a, a commit a sigh if you want a, a signature, right, to validate that where these models came from, if they came from the right place, what is their inheritance properties, and so on. Right? So there is no, there is nothing at all. Right? It's the 
Essentially, uh, downloading a model from Hugging Face is the equivalent of finding a USB key in the parking lot and downloading it from there. Right? Yeah, that's um, yeah. I think that at this stage, pretty much yes, the whole system operates on trust. <laughs> so, and what I see is that uh, people that are actually using uh, some of these models, they do actually trust the developers. So there are a couple of popular developers in Hugging Face. So. Pretty much, they blindly trust what these developers put out, right? So, which is not necessarily the the right approach for enterprise uses, right? So, yeah, the system is really definitely uh, early early days, right? I mean, a lot of lot of yeah. uh, Then uh, this is some more information about this uh, pickle uh, vulnerability. It's in the old CVE from twenty twenty. Uh, so it took a while. Now I think people are slowly moving away from this format, and that's where this uh, uh, scanning for pickle that uh, Hugging Face does. Uh, so yes, people eventually move away and they'll fix it. And now there are other weight formats that are secure. But uh, for a while, this was there, and who knows? Maybe you know there are additional uh, vulnerabilities that have not yet been discovered. Right. So that means that the binary data is not really that safe to to download. Uh, so, okay, what can one do, right? That's the important thing at this point, right, right? Exactly. especially for yes. practitioners. And the question is, what can you do today or what can you try to uh, promote in an organization today in terms of security for this model? Correct. Uh, and uh, mostly uh, the main things you can do today is actually be careful and review things, right? So uh, when it comes to downloading a, or selecting a a model from hugging phase, right? I mean, I uh, need to figure out how the model was constructed, what what was the foundational LLM it was built on, uh, what steps were applied, uh, which data sets that were used, right? Uh, also review the organization that created the model, make sure it's uh, reputable and popular. Um, then when it comes to actually downloading the model, you have to follow uh, certain steps and worry about the hygiene. Uh, this, sometimes these models contain example code that could be malicious. They tell you download this particular package to run the model. These packets could be malicious. Um, there can be, uh, can be either some source code for additional, sometimes they come with scripts because they, they say we have this script that you can use to unpack the weights. This script could malicious, right? So of course you should not trust any of this, right? Until you review whatever can be reviewed. Um, Hugging Face provides some limited support, uh, but this is mostly um, Hugging Face will not really block you or will not really prevent you from downloading a model, even if they detect there is an issue with the model. They will just flag it, right? So you have to be alert to see when uh, in the screen in Hugging Face that you know Hugging Face flag this as potentially malicious. And uh, the problem with all this is that this is all best effort because as we discussed already a couple of times, uh, there is really no clean way to see what is in the model, right? There is no, right, there is no way, right? In the sense that even uh, what I mentioned before, like uh, the remixing steps, the, which data sets were used, uh, the information is based on what is in that readme file in uh, uh, Hugging Face, which is entirely best effort, right? The users right. can do anything they want, right? So there is no programmatic way to to validate that you know this is actually what it is, right? Like something like, for example, salsa. All these things that are actually slowly happening uh, in the, the software uh, supply chain, right? I mean, they really don't don't exist here. There is some initial effort about something called ML bomb, which is uh, aiming to actually address this. So at at some point, you will be able to get a list of ingredients if you want that go into the model, and this will be somehow. Uh, verified uh, or cryptographically signed, but these are definitely early days for this. But again, how can one reverse it, right? I mean, the model is a bunch of data, right? So how do you know, even know if somebody maliciously goes and changes a bunch of numbers there, right? So the, that's the that's the problem. And where, where is this, uh, do you know where is the MLS bomb effort being led in say, is this some standards organization or something? Yes, yes, it is, uh, it, or? yes. I have it actually in the in the in the links at the end. Yeah, there is this. Uh, All right, cool. MLS bombs is from uh, Cyclone DX, but this is mostly the format, right? I mean, so definitely Cyclone DX. They are looking at adding some format that will accommodate uh, machine learning, and I think Google uh, has published uh, some position papers at this point that they actually point out that yes, that's what we need to do. But I don't know if there is any concrete effort at this point. And of course, this has to be an industry right. effort in the sense that it has to be a standard format. The model builders will have to follow it and everybody else, right? So uh, that's going to take a while. Now, 
even for the Google type models, right? Um, you know, I, I believe some of the cloud providers, they tell you, you can come and build on top of our models, right? So they give you as black box, their proprietary models to build on top. But uh, for these ones, I mean, at least you know where they came from. They came from the cloud provider, but you still have no idea what are the data sets that were involved in actually building these models, right? Correct. Yes. So, and that's actually what was here, right? In the sense that uh, in some... well. Well, way. I want to ask the next question there. Right? So okay. if you use a model from one of the cloud providers, right? Yes. And you have this New York New York Times thing now, right? That New York Times yes. is going after open AI. Can they come after you as well? Uh, Nobody yeah. knows, right? Correct, right? So yeah, that's the thing, right? I mean, if I get a model from open AI or I use one of the API models, at least I know that it's built by open AI. So this gives some amount of trust. On the other hand, as you said, I mean, I have no idea what was used to train that model. I have zero visibility what went into that model, right? So uh, some of this material may not be appropriate. Uh, some of this could be copyrighted and all of these lawsuits are going on right now. And it's not clear if I'm liable. Uh, one trend that uh, the big vendors have when it comes to at least liability in terms of uh, copyrighted content is that this liability sealed, right? So Microsoft and now, Google have said that, you know, if somebody sues you for copyright infringement because you used our models and our models generated something that is copyrighted, uh, we'll come and defend you in court, right? But of course, this has not right. been tested at this point. So I'm not sure if enterprises right. will be very comfortable so, in these guys to defend. So they're, they're repeating the Red Hat playbook, right? Because the original reason people were using Red Hat is because exactly the indemnification from open source, right? So we'll expect the the major model providers to provide a similar indemnification to allow enterprises to build on top of them, right? So that's something that people have to keep in mind going forward. Correct, definitely, right? And also this is a sign also that is really hard, right? In a sense, uh, because these models are very powerful and very capable, uh, sometimes it's really very hard to not only prevent them from generating copywriting material, but also to prevent them from generating toxic or illegal content, right? Because uh, uh, these models are powerful. So I think uh, the big vendors are trying to kind of tune them to, or this is the alignment tuning, right? To say, okay, don't really generate toxic content, but these models are quite powerful. So they can usually circumvent uh, these restrictions or maybe using some specially crafted prompt, the so-called prompt injections. I mean, you can really still make them generate toxic content, right? So it's very hard to control these models and make them do exactly what you want, right? So that's another risk that people need to have in mind, right? Uh, and at the end, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So, and at the end, uh, but it could be tempting in the sense that, you know, people will say, instead of going through all the trouble, maybe I get something from OpenAI or from Google or Anthropic and I'm done, right? I don't have to worry about some of these things. Uh, but there are definitely some disadvantages uh, in commercial LLMs, and the main one is the cost for sure, because these models are not free to use, right? Uh, and the cost can go up fairly significantly if you want to fine tune them, right? Because the, these vendors uh, charge even more when you fine tune, depending also on the size of the data set. And obviously, anyone that really wants to use these models, they would like to fine tune them from their own use case. And also there is a lack of control. Not only we don't even know what OpenAI used to train their models, but uh, at some point if OpenAI believes that we are abusing their system, they can block your account. So that's not going to be a very, very good outcome for a company that relies on these models, right? And many times uh, in a specific use case that is fairly narrow, which is actually the most common case probably for enterprises, uh, if you have a small open source LLM that is actually fine tuned to that use case, this can work really well with a tiny fraction of the cost of a large LLM, right? So uh, the point here is that uh, it's not like it's going to be all commercial LLMs and open source market, uh, open source LLMs will, will die. I mean, I think there is going to be a huge uh, demand for open source LLMs, right? Which actually makes solving all these problems we discussed. Uh, right. Right. And then we have to figure out the a new trend, right? The retrieval augmented. Right, and right? exactly. And people guess, uh, it's amazing how quickly this area moves. I mean, every every few weeks, almost, there is new technologies that are getting leveraged. There are people coming with new ideas. The amount of papers being published is tremendous. Uh, the amount of open source libraries that's coming up is, uh, it's, it's, it's really an explosion at this point, right? I mean, it's very exciting, uh, but it's definitely early days, right? So it's important to keep an eye on all these things as they happen and then try to figure out where things go and prepare, right? 
And also an important point is that uh, this is definitely not all about AI risks. The whole area of AI risk is huge. And I think most of this um, event will cover a lot of other aspects of AI and AI risks. Um, in that sense, a good reference is this uh, OWASP top 10 uh, that actually provides a good summary of um, AI risks in general across many dimensions, right? And what we talked today was mostly the, this part here, the supply chain, right? I mean, this is only one of the things that uh, you need to keep an eye on. I think that's pretty much it. And then in the links here, I have a couple of, uh, this is the MLS bomb, the one at the bottom, uh, which is actually uh, Cyclones DX uh, discussion why they want to do it and maybe the format. And also I think this is... Uh, uh, the Google AI transparency, I think it's a good resource to look uh, uh, to see what Google thinks about this. And actually, I think this is aligns very well with uh, we definitely need tools to be able to reliably tell how this model was built. Right. Because that's the starting point of cool. assessing this model for toxicity, for licensing and all this stuff. Right. Great. Well, uh, George, thank you very much for the presentation. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, it was useful for the community to get an idea of uh, what is happening in this world.